Hello, everyone. This is Action Kermit, and welcome to the Wandering In After Chapter discussion for the revised Sitar interlude. So we are going to be going into uh, quite a bit of detail about this part of the Null Moot meeting. And uh, so a couple of discussion guidelines before we begin. Uh, reaction and comments is where to put any thoughts or reactions that you want to be read out loud. If you wish to speak, please ping one of the hosts. That's either me or Lynette has volunteered to also be a host. And then wait for your name to be called. So these are large discussions with a lot of people, and this helps keep things organized and allows people to have time to speak without being interrupted. General is for chatting that will not be read aloud, so keep individual discussions or debates that you do not want to be read aloud in that channel. Okay, so, and yes, waving back at Lynette. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, overall to summary that I did for the action here in this chapter is that Sitar Silverfang and the gang solve a mystery. It starts with the traditional retelling of Nor Nolish lore and then moves on to a whole bunch of legwork and after many trials ends on a high note with proof of the old stories and a dramatic grand working of magic to show the tribes what Earth is actually like. The question of why Doombringers are feared is still unresolved, but Sitar is now in a much better position to investigate the problem than before and has good prospects for continuing her research as books trickle in from Kelt and beyond. So a few thoughts of my own about the chapter before we get into the discussion topics. Uh, the main arc is about Sitar's hunt for the truth of Doombringers, and they haven't succeeded yet, but they made significant progress, and they found, you know, something fishy is going on. It looks like people are trying to mess with knowledge history somehow, and it'll be uh, very interesting to dig into that and figure out where that's going on. So uh, we find out that the wider role of gnolls throughout the world was great explorers and travelers, but they withdrew in the face of their enemies and they he, uh, ignored the fact that they also had friends in, in the same kinds of places, which led to their decline. So Sitar and the gang's research reminds them uh, that the descendants of those friends are still there. So I thought the combination skill at the end of the chapter, World of You and Me, was really outstanding. Uh, Sitar's class consolidation to historian is also unusual and interesting because you don't think of a historian being a spellcaster class. But um, Sitar rolled shaman into archive of storyteller to get the historian of the world class. So I would be very interested to see if Sitar becomes a sage one day by broadening our studies, since a sage, you know, looks at a bit of everything and they have some spellcasting in addition to their uh, traditional academic training. So uh, I also thought as an aside that uh, earlier Sirs and later Mersha both agreed that being too get good at a game is cheating. You know, Sirs was saying that the uh, Ek Touch were cheating at Triumphs and Mersha was saying that uh, Fedo Hep of Kelt was uh, cheating at chess. And they were both just happened to be good through other innate talent or their own efforts. So uh, it was neat to see that connection between the two of them. Uh, I would also like to call out at this point that uh, Duke Rosveri of Island Damas is still a turbo jerk, especially because he seems to have raided one of the Nolish libraries. <laughs> uh, and we got some confirmation of that from Pirate, so it'll be interesting to see if we get any more detail about how exactly that went down. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring to people's attention was uh, Siv Sere in the, uh, the main Wandering In uh, Discord made a really good point about the banality of evil on Earth versus the grandiosity of evil on Inworld. You get these bombastic villains on Inworld that you just don't see uh, on Earth where, you know, you just have normal people who will end up doing horrible things. And also the reality of mutually assured destruction on Earth is just an accepted fact of life here, but it really changes our outlook on armed conflict compared to a medieval society like uh, say, Knowles or Drakes or all of them, although you could argue that Drakes are heading more towards Renaissance society. So, uh, King Fedohep's comment about the terrible pettiness of little children was also hilarious. That was spot on. So, um, you know, shout out for those uh, ideas there. I just wanted to make sure that the rest of the group heard some of those. <laughs> uh, Edge Dancer is staring at e Hitler being a bombastic evil, and that's, you know, kind of fair. But, you know, we also see a lot of the boring stuff. You can pick out examples, but it's just, you know, sort of overall food for thought. Okay, so heading into the discussion tap topics. Uh, I wanted to start with a uh, discussion of Nava Wolf uh, edited this chapter, and we wanted to talk about uh, Pirate's edits of it. So uh, Pirate in particular focused on uh, subplot transitions and point of view shifts, where uh, in the original uh, manuscript there are a lot of point of view shifts, and Pirate tried to reorganize things based on uh, Nava Wolf's critique to try to make that feel like, like a more organic process. So what does the group think about that? So, um, 
how do you think it uh, worked out in terms of the the contrast between the original version and the later version if you had a chance to look at both yep so uh, oshi you had a, something to say short of it is i appreciated nava's commentary on the fact that pirate does this often where um because of the way they write because of the focus of their writing especially during um stream and stuff what will happen is they they will unconsciously skip the structure that you need for switching between perspectives switching between things so what will happen is they'll shift from oh we're we're, we're in mercia's point of view mercia's talking mercia's talking and then somewhere along the way pirate talks and inserts a comment and says a little joke and then we switch back to not pirate but the third pov that um is in the scene like Aaron, and then we'll switch back to mercia and then we'll have pirate make a comment in the middle of that it's like pirates having this um meta commentary on top of the actual story on top of the actual like aspect of it, it it's it's something that we've been trained to read properly, but it's not necessarily something that comes across really well. And I and I appreciated the steps that Pirate was taking to improve that. Which I don't know. Did you think it was an improvement, Kermit? Yeah, I mean, it did feel more organic how the transitions worked here. I'm sort of conditioned to follow that uh, meta commentary, as you said there. I do uh, really like watching the streams. And uh, that sort of comes out in the final parts of the chapter. So uh, it's interesting. Pirates said, you know, in their own notes that one of the reasons that they keep hiring these different editors is to keep doing the big challenging chapters whenever they have a professional edit look, look at it. So they can try to grow their craft in some way based on the perspectives of these people. So uh, this is, I think, an example of a pirate being experimental here. So uh, it looks like Metamir is also saying that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Metamere says, I didn't do the pre-edit comparison, but I thought it flowed a lot better than other chapters where there are a lot of POV shifts. There were more smooth transitions to give context rather than abrupt jump, jump cuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I did a brief scan of the original version of it, but I uh, read the uh, final version of it a couple of times in the process of making these notes. And uh, I didn't really see uh, the things that Nava Wolf was saying needed improvement in the final version. And that's a, a, an indication that they uh, uh, responded to that, really, I think. So uh, people in the chat briefly talked about, you know, five different POV shifts in one scene, and we don't really see that anymore. So let's see. With uh, no other commentaries about this, let's move on to the next discu discussion topic, which is... Uh, I have I a guess question for the group, if, if you don't mind, Kermit. Sure. So, um, one of the complaints that we get all the fucking time, especially on Reddit and on, and various things, is that there's too many perspectives, too many things to keep track of, too much stuff. Do you think? Do you guys, the group, think that this kind of Im helped improve that to a point where it's something that's consumable and that it's easier for us to, like, what's? Oh, my brain is freezing. Um. Um, picture it, visualize it, whatever you want to say. Mm. Would that help? Because we're not going to get less storylines, but would would a more clearly done POV shift structure help reduce the complexity to a point where you're willing to at least consume the information and it's easier to consume? Uh, yes, yeah. so uh, Lynette says uh, they want to discuss that. I've got um, a, an opinion about how some authors view the world inside their own head. Um, I think that a lot of authors grew up reading a lot of different types of books. And the mediums in all of our storylines throughout the decades has also changed quite a bit. You've got authors now who their primary intake of entertainment was more visual than um, having to imagine what the words on the page are telling them. So you don't necessarily connect the same way with having a point of view being you're inside that person's brain and you are listening to the things that they can hear and you are think seeing what they think and 
you notice things that they notice, but also if they don't notice it, you didn't notice it either. So it can be an unreliable narrator kind of thing. Versus manga, where you are outside this whole thing and you're looking in a, in a third person perspective at everything going on around you. And that makes it, I think, a little bit easier to what we call head hop between different characters. My personal take on that is that Pirate is used to the 3D or the, the third person view of the surrounding scene, not necessarily having the character be inside their head where we can experience everything the character is experiencing. I think that they are getting a lot better about telling the difference between the two, um, which is eye-opening to me for just seeing how certain authors view their own um, creation inside their mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it's interesting sometimes these issues about, you know, time and distance being elastic that we sometimes talk about and also the perspective jumping. Uh, the Fae, the way Pirate has written them is like an embodiment of these kinds of story issues. <laughs> It's like they take that and they turn it into a positive force, and that's just how their world functions. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that's always going to be with us in the story, I believe. So, uh, it looks like uh, Edge Dancer wanted to say uh, something. Uh, Edge says, frankly, I think if you dislike having multiple perspective, I think you're just going to have a harder time with Pirate's writing. I think lots of point of views are pretty fundamental to the way Inverse is being told. Jamaro says, does anyone remember Lakin's first POV chapters, how different they were compared to third person? And then Metamere comes in with, I like the mental workout it requires to fully appreciate it. Sometimes it's too much to handle, but then I just have to reread a small section. I sometimes wish side character appearance descriptions were slightly more frequent. There are enough fan illustrations of main characters to make things easier for me. Mm. Yes, you. Meta, it sounds like you also see things in your head visual kind of like that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, I agree about having a bit more in terms of scene description and, you know, how characters, you know, appear in the moment instead of having one description of them once and then that's it uh, would add a bit more color to the story, I think. So it looks like Renoris wants to say something about point of view shifts. Yeah, I... I like the feedback, the fact that pirates started incorporating it because I think it's fine for the characters we've known for a long time. So, like, you know, if it's like the horns, yeah, I know what horn is talking without you know needing to have any dialogue tags or anything. But like, we've been getting a lot of new characters this volume, and getting a lot of other characters explored. So, you know, I think it's helpful to incorporated especially as like kind of you have the newer scenes if you're like sitting in the end or like the scene is you know everybody's sitting in the end and people are talking like you know you could probably understand who everybody is just because you've had so much exposure but i think some of like the new ones with like satar being a new kind of point of view um i think it was helpful yes i thought the description of satar's uh, traditional regalia and all of that was a very interesting way of establishing the scene and who she is as a character. That was uh, a very vivid depiction. So, uh, Metamir? He said, I asked about um, seeing it in his mind the way Pirate does, and he says, yes, I try to make it like I'm watching a movie. Sometimes I have to shift it to a radio play when it jumps right to dialogue. <laughs> okay, yeah. And it looks like we have a couple of people still typing here. Oh, wow. This is a deep topic. Fill the, fill the void, Kermit. Fill the void while they type. Ah, uh, shoot. Uh, I'm my brain is sort of going ahead to the other topics right now. Okay, so, well, can can I fill the void? Because sure. uh, that's all I got. I can only be here for an hour anyway. So the perspective shifting thing. The reason I asked about it, and the reason I'm trying to like get more conversation about it, is because it's one of the. It really is one of the most common critiques. People bitch and moan on Reddit. I mean, it's Reddit, but still, people bitch and moan about it. Because the story's growth has required more focus on more things. And it leads often into the complaints of, I don't like this storyline. 
I don't like this perspective. And I oftentimes wonder if part of the disconnect between the reader and the writer in that way, in that enjoyment level, is, is not because the plethora of perspectives is clouding the strength of the emotional arcs that are being created. Maybe it's just pure hate, but even I have to admit, despite my hatred of Flos, there is there is excellent writing in the K chapters. I mean, everybody talks about Rialt's, King Rialt's um, storyline and the uh, the growth of his daughter, but even without that, there are small moments and points of view that you'll miss just because you're so exhausted from trying to not exhausted is the right word, maybe overwhelmed from trying to incorporate all of these POVs. And the flow matters a lot. It really does help make things easier. And it speaks to a larger issue in um, in lit RPGs and web serials that they don't innovate because they think that this they're afraid that they're going to get the same critiques that Pirate does, but they're not as good a writer as Pirate. So they're going to get... Um, well, my readers are not going to be able to, you know, read this, and they're not going to be able to understand this, and I can't, I have to go where my readers go, but it, it stops them from trying new things, and I wonder a lot if part of the reason um, writers are so delicate with their writing is because of this. They just don't feel like their readers will enjoy it, and the reader, it's it's like a feeding feedback loop. The readers can't aren't trained to understand it and the writers aren't able to move past it. Mm. Yeah. So it looks like we have a couple more different comments here. Uh, Spanner uh, specifically wants to call out good guy flows. Ostry likes him confirmed. Uh (laughs) Which I think is just intended to start an argument there. Uh, Hellfire Blues is saying that they think that's why they have less problems with some er, than uh, some people because they don't picture things that way. Uh, Kilara says that it doesn't bother her, her either way, but uh, she does believe that more frequent shifts make it harder for infrequent readers to catch up up every couple of months. Harder doesn't mean bad writing choices, though. So uh, Coldbringer says if this chapter had an overpopulation of perspectives, he would argue that Numerous perspectives were too similar to one another and not high, too high in sheer number. So ca- similar in terms of character, race, age, gender, social background, personalities, and characters with high character perspective counts uh, have been written before but didn't struggle with having distinctive character voices. Because of the setting of those chapters, such as The Wandering In Itself or with Dram or Flos' Warband, are fundamental melting pots of diversity. The tribal monoculture of the meaning of the tribes is antithetical to this, despite the author's attempts at diversifying the tribes. That is kind of an interesting point uh, about the meeting of the tribes being, uh, you know, all gnolls in a way, but then also the tribes have distinctive subcultures within them. They don't necessarily meet that often, and there isn't that much opportunity for them to uh, and do cultural exchange necessarily. So they, there are ways to differentiate them, I think. So... Um, Metamir is saying that you can actually treat TWI like several different fictions. Uh, When they first read it, they went by individual storylines, not chronologically, and they got too involved and and, uh, have to know how a story arc resolves. It was easier to keep track of things this way as well, which is kind of interesting. Oshi, you wanted to respond to Coldbringer? Why don't we do Spanner's comment first? Ah, uh, yes. So, so Spanner says, perspective shifts are difficult to get down. Given the scope of the world, it isn't surprising that people struggle. That being said, you learn the characters and it becomes second nature after a while to know who speaks, which is, I think, a pretty fair uh, observation. So now, Oshi. Okay. So Colt's right that it is monocultural and it's difficult to establish the difference, differences between the various people because everyone's a shaman, a warrior, a a and the only monikers that we have to differentiate them are the tribes, but we're not familiar enough with the tribes. Part of why we have been a little stuck on the newt is because Pirate didn't have the space or didn't couldn't take the space or didn't want to, I'm not sure why, to build up the various um knowledge tribes before this possible to do that. It's certainly possible to create that um, differentiation. And it's not exactly like it's not there. It's just not 
necessarily enough for everybody. So some folks will are visual learners, so they need visual differences between the dolls. They need to see color differently or read about color differently. Others mm -hmm. need to read about personality differences. I mean, the Damas metal tribe is not the same as the Plains Eye. It's not the same as the Silver Fangs. And Pirate does their best to use details, but details are being lost in the prose, was my point. And I think that's the key to it. But, you know, I could be wrong. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, so uh, moving on for a bit, uh, Jamaro says the meeting seemed more diverse at first with the name to be our adventuring team made of many species, but they were heavily sidelined and only the, the name Noel was utilized further. So this uh, section of the story, uh, the Noel Moot, or the Newt, <laughs> as Aaron insists on calling it, uh, is you know primarily about Noelish characters. So I do like having those other you know, folks like the strategists on the sidelines, but this is ultimately about what's going to happen with Knowles here. And I get the feeling, you know, as a gut instinct that the, uh, the this meeting of the tribes is going to break up in explosive fashion and then Knowles are going to head in every direction. So we're going to have a lot of uh, chances to see them exploring the world again like they once did. So uh, Ren said that Newt could be an entire novel like Gravesinger, but instead it has to be spread out through the entire volume, which is uh, another good thing. Like uh, uh, I think it was Metamir was saying before, you can treat the wandering in like several different fictions. And this is, you know, could be one of them is the whole Nolish saga. So uh, I think at this point at 9 million words, it's, close to what 49 Harry Potter novels or something in terms of length. Uh, so yeah, you can absolutely uh, split out the different regions into uh, different fictions that uh, sort of interweave with each other, sort of like the retellings that they were just describing in there. So it looks like we have a couple of people talking about this. So let's have maybe one or two uh, more uh, comments on this line, and then we can move on to some of the other topics here in the recording. So uh, Jamaro says the newt has a bit too much in terms of Knowles just talking in tense. Uh, it does tend to get tiring if, uh, after a while. That or Mersha being sad. Noka and Karash are both uh, at the newt and dreadfully underutilized. I think those two are going to show up in a big way towards the end of the newt. This is all going somewhere. Uh, so, Burv here yeah, that, says... Mm -hmm. Yes? I was just going to give your voice a break. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Do that. Burv says, Hello, Comrade Burv here. I believe that another thing that sometimes... Or another thing that's something that causes the null focused chapters to suffer in terms of perspectives is that null names are particularly more fantasy than, say, Antinium. You remember Yellow Splatters because it's a name that sticks out and is easily understandable. Other random example would be Moore, which rolls off the tongue and readers can visualize it easier. But with the null chapters, you get Zero and Yelroan and Thika and in such rapid succession that for me personally, my brain just groans trying not only to remember their unusual names and their unique details. Mm. Yeah, so I guess uh, Yellow Splatters is a fairly self-explanatory name in terms of talking about visually what they look like. It's tied straight into their name there. Personally, so, I have that same problem with cultivation novels. So, mm. you know. <laughs> yeah, cultivation novels tend to recycle the same handful of names over and over again. It can be uh, quite tricky because uh, we don't have the inflections in our alphabet the same way that we do. Yeah. So uh, Ren says that she can understand that even with her love of fantasy names. <laughs> you know, she is talking about Great Master of Heaven's Fire Lee. Yeah, so uh, let's move on for a bit to with some of the other topics because we've talked a lot about the style, but we haven't really gotten into the topics yet of, you know, what happened in the chapter yet. So um, I wanted to move on to this uh, topic, Sitar's Doombringer investigation. That's really the main part of the chapter. So uh, I thought it was really uh, interesting seeing uh, Sitar and Yelroan's uh, reaction to Mersha. You know, this is an opportunity for them to grow because they both had assumptions about what Doombringers are like that are now being unchallenged. And we see this growing desire to know the truth and refine investigative methods. And, you know, world, the world of you and me skill was uh, really impressive and, you know, opens up possibilities in the future for more research. Uh, especially about investigating, you know, Doombringers, but the possible uses of our analysts. So what did you guys think about this whole process of the investigation and what they found and where it leads? Okay, so uh, Renoris, you wanted to say something? 
Yes, I guess just as overview of the whole chapter i thought well at first i was like i'm not sure i want to just do another point of view now so i kind of slept on it but i think i really liked sitar i, I really just like these like writer characters that have appeared over last volume because i'm just kind of like well i'm a person who reads a lot of novels I haven't written anything but I, I definitely empathize with like i just want a good book and it being really hard to get a really a good book. So that was cool. Um, and then I will say, though, I I felt like Satar went a little too quickly from, like, Doombringers are evil to, well, I'm going to help Marisha. And I felt that was also true for the mathematician. Yel- I can't uh, Yelrovan, I believe. Yeah, Yelrovan. Like, I mean, I get it. You know, I think there's been a lot of, previous background where we've seen the nose transition from it uh and you could say well you know sitar had the skill right the spot inconsistency skill which i thought was like like super cool uh like just the way that skill got applied uh and i guess yarovan you could say the same thing with the mathematician but i don't know i felt like the transition was a little too quick from like these people are evil and you know yarovan basically like having that conditioning of doombringers must die to like i'm not gonna i'm gonna go against my tribe i don't know it was a little quick Mm. so yeah it does look like you know something is being done to manipulate gnolls into opposing doombringers but we don't exactly know what that is or who's responsible for it or what their motives are so uh there was a yes nope you're good Okay, so uh, Edge Dancer was saying, I think the skill, the world of you and me, is the one skill that I would desperately want in our world. I also know that this wasn't exactly a unique thought, but I felt like Pirate was putting part of themselves into Sitar. Yes, I remember that in the stream. Pirate said that they uh, specifically were uh, jealous of Sitar's skills, and uh, Sitar is not a self-insert, and Sitar can uh, go take a long walk off a short pier because of having all these things that make their life so much more convenient. (laughs) Uh, so Ren was saying that uh, she loves how all these novelists are thirsty and uh, now just because that she can relate to that uh, so Oshi you wanted to say something else oh um, I agree with Ranaris and I think I know why Pirate wasn't able to flesh out at least what was the quick turnaround for one thing for Sitar I, I think we can give her give her a little bit of a break because Sitar's young her experience of these things and her sense of like pirate spends a lot of time focusing on the fact that Sitar wants the truth that she's to her. The truth is important. That's why she loves history. That's why she's not like, actually I disagreed with Kermit a little bit when he said that she's on the path to becoming a sage because she's not to her. It's more, it comes from a place of knowing the truth and saying the truth because she thinks the world itself the the story of the world itself is it doesn't need embellishment it, it it's already wonderful and i actually really like that aspect of her mm-hmm. the in the thing for her as i was trying because she focused so much on truth and because she's so young she still has a level of night na- not naivety what's the, what's the thing where your positive outlook when you're young help me lynette you're old Optimism. <laughs> shut up <laughs> Just for that, idealism. I'm not saying. Nope. Thank idealism. Thank you, Spanner. So, um, the idealism is still intact with her, and here's the reflection in the mathematician in Yalaron, is that he's still idealistic too. Think about how much of an academic he is. He's obsessed with math. He doesn't really think about the rest of the world. He just wants to. He he's sort of, despite his age, he kind of skims the top of the rest of the world. Where we're shown. This is one of those points where I think it's a lot of show and very little tell. In the past, when Yellow Room was shown, it was like, he's so super enthusiastic, he wants to spread the message, and he's funny and stuff, but we never really dip into his, how the hell did this person, he's older, he doesn't have sisters or brothers, and he doesn't talk about his wife or his children. He's the eccentric scientist with who makes a... Um, he 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 figures out how to make a nuke, 
and it's like, oh my god, oh no, they're gonna use the nuke. That's that's the that's the thing I got from him. That is why I I I think it's not very clear in this particular chapter, and because of the way it develops, it makes it harder to see. Because as Cold and others have noted, the length of the uh, the way it's settled out over the course of like the whole volume, it's hard to connect those pieces together. So you mm. can't see the development, and it's a lot harder to reflect on. Okay. Yeah. That's with it. yeah, so with highly technical characters like that in history, there have been examples of you know people who are very far removed from the way their work is actually used. And uh, were surprised and displeased about where it went after they did, you know, whatever communing with the truth they wanted to do. Uh, one particular uh, example that pops out of my mind is the guy who invented mines, like sea mines and land mines, was convinced that this was an ethical application of uh, his knowledge to warfare because it's a purely defensive weapon. And now, of course, after World War II ended, there are landmines scattered all over uh, the battlefields that have been blowing up innocent people for decades. And he just never imagined that such a thing would uh, take place, even though he was designing weapons that were built to do specifically that. So uh, it's not terribly surprising to me that we have a, a very rarefied academic who's having trouble squaring the, the real world impact of what he's doing. Burv says it took Marcia basically sacrificing herself in the dungeon for a lot of the Lascore City Knolls to stop wanting her dead. It seems like for this chapter, characters were able to do it in an afternoon. Metamir says Marcia's just too sympathetic for them. While it would have been interesting to continue with the mathematician villain, I'm really happy with Yel Rowan and Sitar questioning their ingrained beliefs. I think this plot line will continue to be a lot of fun. And Kel says Sitar also has had time to see Marcia just being a child. And it's very difficult to see that and match that up to the terrifying Doombringer. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Europe, you wanted to say something about the Null turnaround? Uh, yeah, the, uh, as people have said, uh, the Sitar has the skill and the, uh, like, there's all of that around it, as people have said. But also, Yellowrun, like, this is pretty consistent for him. Like, when he was originally finding Mersha, he wasn't really much of a villain. Like, when he, ah, oh, I found that they're going here and here and here, and that means they're going to end up in this town at this time. And then the chieftain went said, oh, great, we're going to go kill them. And Yelran realized that he hadn't actually thought about that and was disturbed by it already. And that was before he saw a literal child sitting there and think, th in front of him and thinking, I'm going to go get this person murdered. Like, it's not inconsistent at all with his character. He's never been super on board with the whole killing thing, uh, or never been super comfortable with it. It's just, it happened away from him. Mm. Okay, so it looks like, like we have a couple more people here. I guess there's three more comments incoming. So uh, after we do that, uh, let's say we move on to another topic after those three. So, uh, Jamaro says, uh, yo, yo on math antics, uh, were improved compared to the previous chapters where he was doing some incoherent things with math. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> we're, we're... <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Uh, Jamaro, you can elaborate on that. I'm sure. Uh, there were. A lot of what Yelleron was uh, doing earlier, I thought, was you know record keeping and skill assisted stuff that you can't necessarily do with uh, conventional math knowledge alone. Uh, I was sort of uh, thinking there's an, an amount of hand waving there just because of the the su overtly supernatural way that skills can work in uh, the in world. There's stuff that you can't do with a sword either that uh, is absolutely possible in, with an uh, in world sword play. So. Uh, uh, Coldbringer had to say that uh, he liked the ideas behind Sitar, a writer adjacent class taking up the primary role in the center of events, successfully analyzing story narratives and seeing the overall trend of illogic inconsistency, he, uh, and concluding that the narratives have been corrupted and then working to defeat those false narratives by bringing in more reliable narratives from outside nations and continents. 10 out of 10 idea. The peer review process and dramatic action. 
Uh, however, he thinks that Sakura's character development arc, her motivations and wants and fears and character voice weren't distinctive enough for her to rise above being a walking camera or class on wheels, as seen in various private, or prior characters who feel more definable by their class than by their actual personalities. So characters need some charisma to hold my interest as a reader. I'm not going to, or excuse me, I'm not sure about other readers, but this wasn't a particularly charismatic character to follow. Uh, Yelroan, at least, had an appreciable struggle developed over numerous chapters with moral dilemmas over Mersha and the Doombringers. So I think on a personal level, Sitar uh, does have room to grow, yes. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing her in through the lens of her class because that's really what she's trying to do i think her uh, motive in getting involved in all of this first was a a great passion for leveling so as she gets more entangled with the world around her i think in subsequent chapters we may see more of that individualization uh so uh, uh spanner says they didn't want her dead in list or they weren't nice to her though uh, whereas at the Newt, certain tribes, such as the Sauron's Eye tribe, Kof Kof, do want her dead, and uh, Mersha is not equal to evil uh, for Yalroan. He describes her as a little girl, which doesn't fit the Doombringer. He was realizing it earlier when he said anyone else, else it would be murder, but Doombringers are okay. So, uh, yeah, brainwashing does have those downsides. I mean, it, it can be hard to overcome that if you uh, have had decades of people working on you in order to ingrain a prejudice like that. But, um, yeah, so we will see if there's growth there. Uh, I suspect Mersh is going to get in serious trouble towards the climax of the uh, the meeting, but we will see uh, in the future. So uh, Metamir says um, they wonder how much knowledge they'll gain from the combined skill. Did Yellowwind just download some math knowledge? Uh, that's possible. Personally, I suspect that he uh, only just saw the books were there, but then he got ca- or, uh, tackled by campus security by just being too rowdy. Uh, so he at least knows what questions to start asking, though. So uh, <laughs> part-time Hermit says, you may say that Zatara is trying to do what's right, spelled W-R-I-T-E, which is a fine pun, a fine pun indeed. So uh, it, Edge Dancer also says that uh, his favorite parts of Zatara was in the earlier parts of the chapter, where it felt like the ending didn't flesh out as much. Uh, their favorite moment is when she was waking up to the narrative around her and using spot inconsistencies narrative. Uh, I personally really liked when she was doing the retelling in front of the tribe, and then she uh, calmed herself down by imagining it as being the same as when she was telling uh, her uh, brother about uh, the same things. So we got to see uh, you know, the brother-sister interaction going on there as well, and that's a meta layer on top of uh, the uh, retelling that's happening in front of hundreds of other people. I thought that was a pretty cool plot device. So um, let's move on a little bit more uh, into another topic on the list, which is Mersha's plan to help Sitar. So uh, Mersha ended up leveraging her connections to Kel and just knowing from the inn all sorts of people from far distant places like the Earl of Rains and so on, uh, trying to get, you know, outsider perspectives in to uh, help Sitar complete her research because the, uh, the meaning of the tribes was a dead end. So we also saw uh, Fedo Hep of of Kel himself making decisions about when to intervene and uh, how much to leave up to uh, the researchers themselves to figure out on their own because of uh, it would be beneficial to them to go through the exercise. And then we had all these other leaders like the uh, the Garuda monarch, and then we had that Naga, and then we had the uh, the Bow Kingdom of Avil and so on. So uh, what was your impression here about what this means for uh, both the group themselves and for the meaning of the tribes at large? So uh, Jamaro is saying that the TV shenanigans are sort of overdone at this point. It's happened a lot this volume. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, various rulers and groups and things are starting to see the advantages of getting on television uh, as a political weapon. And they are uh, taking advantage of it more than they did in the earlier phases, I think. So uh, the audiences and uh, presenters may get a bit more jaded as time goes on, but they're definitely exploring the possibilities right now. Uh, Lynette, you wanted to say something? Um, referring back to the TV shenanigans being a bit overdone. Well, remember, TV's only been a thing for six months. Eight months, maybe. They're still figuring out what can be done with this medium in a large-scale... It's like a large-scale me- message system where you can tell everybody what's going on all at the same time, and the transparency is improved, and you don't have to... 
you know, wait for several weeks for everybody to hear about something through the Mages Guild, which might be lying anyway because they were paid to. They're taking advantage of all of this now and testing out what can be done with it because it is still really new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, Metamir is also saying that they think there will be a large audience demanding to get Sitar's history writing, which will be cool. Uh, so they wonder if Mercia's luck school, or skill came into play. Yeah, that's a possibility. And then that also means if her luck skill is happening, there's going to be a proportionate backlash because of the way it works. So uh, we will find out as that develops. Uh, Edge Dancer is saying, yes, in the world, they're still developing it, but they think using it as a narrative tool to solve problems is the, the, uh, at the heart of the issue. Uh, Oshi says that he can see uh, Jamaro's point of view. It's not that it's logically inconsistent. It's using the concept of TV as a solution too much. So uh, Ren is saying that there's a TV bubble going on right now. And uh, Spanner is saying that uh, Rose hits the nail on the head. Uh, this is the first time anyone has seen things. Uh, humans, when first shown TV, were scared of the train coming towards them. This is a new technology that is being explored in strange ways. Kasim Vir of Chandrar was just played as a backdrop in lots of places unedited. In World is figuring it out. Uh, so Edge Dancer is saying, if every problem is solved by we TV source it, then it gets a bit dull, which I think is fair. Uh, there's going to be some backlash against TV sourcing everything because uh, I think later, because people are going to realize everyone is watching TV, including Rochelle, for example. <laughs> you know, maybe they want to pull it in a little bit and not uh, advertise absolutely everything. So we'll see uh, when that happens. You know, it's like when Bolavier showed up on the group chat when they were trying to figure out how to cure Aaron. You know, that had a definite chilling effect that we haven't seen all over the place yet. So um, Jamaro said that they referred to TV as a story tool to resolve problems rather than a novelty within the story. It's a bit like Pirate's usual deus ex, but this one has already been used a few times. Uh, so a part-time hermit is saying, if a group of shamans started their own television network, would you call it an alternative medium? Uh, I'm not sure if medium is a part of the shaman class. Uh, we may end up seeing that if shamans get more involvement with spirits later on as the, uh, the barriers to the spirit world break down in the story. But uh, that was a, another pretty decent pun. Uh, so, Renoris, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I guess... I've been thinking about this for a little bit, but I feel like I don't know that it's TV so much as like Fedohap being used as like just this. I mean, he's just like a solve everything. <laughs> like he just solves everything. Like I, I kind of am getting tired of it because like I get it. Like he's bored and he he's trying to influence the world around him and he's trying to help Aaron. But I just feel like we're like he's just his weight in the narrative was too big. Like. And I, I think what's going to happen, you know, is we've it, it's going to be a Zell effect where I feel like we've leaned on him too much on the narrative. And so he's going to get off. I mean, probably after Aaron comes back. But to me, it's just like Fedor has involving himself too much. And I feel like it's is your fear a little... that he's being used too much or is your fear that Fedor Hep is going to die? Which one? I mean both, right? I mean, I actually more of the first. I feel like he's being used too much. And I don't quite understand like why. Like I, I kind of get it, right? He's pen pals with Mish Misha, but like ultimately, it's just like he's being used way too much to solve every problem, in my opinion. Because he's like solved like almost every problem, uh, in the volume. I feel like so. He's. Has he? I mean, I, I don't, felt I like don't it. See it. I don't, I don't see, I think the problem is that he's too involved in the null storyline. He's solved he's been intimately involved in the solutions to the knowledge one, so that's how it comes across. But when you look at his overall involvement in the volume, it's not as much as you think. It's just he just has too much influence over the knowledge stuff. Which is where a, I, I I don't know about that though cuz like I feel like he's Maybe maybe I'm wrong and maybe it's just I haven't like looked at it too much, but like he's been getting you know, you might say he's not as quite involved in the King chapters unless they're directly involved with him, but then the revenant that he woke up like just went and like basically rescued Mars. I mean made the army that was surrounding Mars kind of retreat. So to me that's like Kelt indirectly having a lot of impact. You got the crazy vizier destroying that army of Gade, right? So yeah, but it's that like... was that was Aaron. 
okay, but like Aaron's leveraging Kel as like it's like the singular tool, and I'm just like, well, it's the only one she's got at the moment in Chandra, I think. I mean, honestly, if you if you look at it from a strategist point of view, you're going to be using every tool you have to affect as much as you can. And Aaron right now only has one. She's only got one tool. And if she can convince him to help, then she will. And she did. But that's that's not necessarily that he's been He doesn't he doesn't want you to have it for free. He wants to make sure that, you know, he's not the only one putting in the work, which I get, but you know, he's yeah. Yeah, we've also seen El Davin trying to do something very similar, getting his fingers in too many pies and getting too entangled to use the term that half elves are famous for. So uh, we may end up seeing them get in trouble as a consequence of being too interventionist in this uh, new environment. And, you know, I do think probably they're going to end up uh, in a bad way because they threw their weight around too much. There has yet to be any sort of reckoning for when uh, the crazy vizier went and tortured Flos, the king of destruction himself, trying to get him to submit to Kel. And that was nothing that uh, Fedohep wanted, but it is something that he made happen by uh, releasing the vizier. So there will need to be accountability for that, and with Flo's accountability means massive armies, and then his own side is going to be fighting itself. So uh, there is trouble to coming down the line from these sorts of decisions that were made, like, and also the, the conflict between Risveri and Aldavin that has yet to you know, really heat up over in uh, Iowa Damas, but there's you know, trouble is mounting on the horizon. So there, I think there are going to be consequences. So uh, there are a couple of different comments that have come in uh, over the discussion. One is Kelara saying, Fedohep is the one normally spearheading these efforts. Uh, she thinks that this uh, means his time left is limited. And yeah, I, I agree with that. So uh, Menemir says it's good to have at least one OP ally to make up for all the OP villains. And yeah, that's definitely true. Just having... Uh, you know, Bill Avier and Azkarash and, you know, Rizveri and who knows what else out there making their own moves. Uh, you know, you have to have some kind of balance. So uh, Edge Dancer is saying it seems pretty fair to say that Fedohep has got his undead fingers and a lot of pies, you know, maybe too many narratively. And yeah, I think we uh, talked about that at some length. Uh, Kilara was saying that's fine. Kelt is a tool, but uh, she expects it to be removed because it's become too much of a crutch for Aaron and company. Yeah, so I suspect Aaron is going to have some lingering connection to Kelt. Uh, going ahead, but uh, nothing nearly as involved in this, I suspect, at least until like the very end of the story. We may see some, you know, sort of epilogue deeply enmeshed into Kells or maybe in a couple of volumes or something. But uh, as Jansen was saying, if the only reason that problems can't be solved is Fedo saying, nah, I don't want it, or your way of solving a problem is entertaining Fedo, it can get narratively stale. So. I think he's going to be Im very embroiled in his own problem soon as, you know, Flos picks up momentum again and tries to make Kelt answer for what the crazy vizier did to him. So, uh, Jamara was saying those points were brought up previously on Discord, and to that I say, soon Aaron will be against Rashal, the blighted kingdoms, and the literal gods themselves. Yeah, so uh, even, you know, Kelt is not going to be able to bail them out of this one. So, it'll be interesting to see... Uh, you know, I suspect there's probably going to be a world tour of Aaron happening where she's putting out fires everywhere. There's kind of a traditional thing that's been hinted at before where once somebody hits level 50, they do a grand tour of the world like, uh, you know, Nears did once visiting Naravia's tomb and all sorts of other death zones uh, just to, you know, show off how good they are. And Aaron's going to end up doing that by accident, just running around, putting out as many fires as they can. Uh Oshi is saying you need a Gandalf, which is pretty cool, and Eldavin doesn't really uh, fit the bill. There's a lot of uh, Wistrom mages who wish they were Gandalf, but they don't have those kinds of chops or those kinds of ethics. Uh, so um, Jamaro is saying she is not overpowered, she is underpowered, which is uh, kind of interesting, I think. Uh, so Metamir is saying all it would take is Actelia's threatening Kelt to remove his aid. So, um, which is also fair. Actelia's is about to be... Uh, attacking the kingdom of destruction fairly soon i do believe so uh yeah so kel is saying that roshal is waiting in the wings uh they're famously protective of their slavers and we've had quite a few of them die towards you know either you know the allies of the inn at this point whether they're the antinium or pisces or something like that they've been sort of dying like flies as uh 
Emir Yazidal tries to, you know, get his fingers into the uh, the in world you know, connection somehow. So there's probably going to be another reckoning for that, and the action is really going to heat up there. Uh, so uh, Jamaro says that Terry Arc the White returning to Bale as the protagonist. <laughs> that would be a pretty interesting thing, you know. Uh, uh, Gandalf had that one scene where he just said, "Oh man, this Balrog is too overpowered. Why don't you just leave? I'll take care of it myself." Uh, so yeah. And Kalar is pointing out Gandalf dies in air quotes. So um, it comes back better than ever. And who knows? I- I'm kind of expecting El Davin to either die or be seriously injured or somehow cut off from Terry Arc with some catastrophic consequences. And I, watch, you know, I, I pray, I, I pray, I'm not a religious person, but I pray that uh, Terry's not dead, even though I think he is. Mm. And that, that, that the Gal- Gandalf gambit is what pirate is doing with Terry Arc. So yeah, we can hope. We can hope, but I don't believe I have no trust. I know Pirate Ever comes out and says that we should trust them, but don't trust them. Yep. Hope is a very cruel thing. Yeah, so Pirate has said at one point that they feel personally comforted by knowing where all of this is going and we don't have that same perspective. You got cut off. You got cut off for action. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, Pirate has said at one point that they feel personally comforted by knowing where all of this is going, and we don't have that same perspective. So it can be harder for us to uh, see some of the trials and tribulations that happen in the short term. So uh, Jamara was saying we need Ryoka to save Terry Arc for once so that he gets humbled and even with her. Yeah, that's fair enough. So uh, briefly, one other thing I wanted to do here is let's move on to another topic. Uh, we're sort of getting towards the end of the recording time here. It's been almost an hour. Uh, let's get into the tribal politics of what happened in the, the meeting of the chieftains, because there was a lot that happened there, too, uh, in this discussion. So we had, um, there was that chieftain Yu from the uh, the bird tribe that was uh, planning on leaving because they were surrounded by enemies. Uh, there's a groups that are reconsidering the Grand Queen's offer of land and thinking about where they can get allies on Israel. Uh, they have just seen the Raskar threat and found out that there's more of them and buried in other dungeons and things. And then their relations to Earthers have really uh, been solidified over the course of this chapter. So a lot of important people made important decisions here. So uh, what's your all's perspective on uh, where that's going? So... Um, I think that Chieftain Yu had a really good point. It looks like they are, you know, sort of surrounded by enemies at this point in their uh, refuge. And it sort of raises the question of if they do go somewhere else, it's in the name of safety, where can they go where they'll find shelter? I mean, there was some indication that some tribes could find a uh, safe harbor with the lizard folk in Balaros. Uh, they you mentioned, the op- you yes. mentioned something earlier in the recording about how, um, let me scroll back up a little bit here, and it said... They had um, gone out into the world and they had made enemies, but they had forgotten that they'd also made friends. And it, to mm-hmm. me, it sounds like you has also forgotten that there are potential allies and friends and they're only looking at this one little corner of the world and they feel cut off and lost and alone. And it's not necessarily the truth. Mm-hmm. They might, might not be, but that's how, that's how narrow their vision has become now that you know the meeting of tribes is only what a couple hundred thousand people yeah i think it's going to be interesting if it suddenly comes out that the reason why liscor is fighting hectfall is because uh lism who is like the leading conservative drake on the council was so disgusted by the idea of poor workers and this exploitation of nulls that the Heckfall was taking for granted. So uh, they were saying, what allies are there, you know, for nulls uh, in this part of Israel? Why would you stay here? And then the answer would be, oh, hey, here's Liscor, which has this very null-friendly policy here. So uh, we may end up seeing some tribes either visiting or sticking around after the uh, the meeting of the tribes breaks up. <laughs> Edge Dancer says, it feels like the nullish spirit of adventure is lost, and Courier responds with, yeah, the dead god stole it. <laughs> Metamir says, I think there will be a huge power shift since they assign things based on merit and gifts. I have a feeling that the most, that arms, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a feeling that the powerful traditionalists will probably be cut off at the knees due to the Doombringer debacle. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, Silverfang is getting a reputation uh, a debtor was pointing out that uh, Silverfang is bringing the best warnings to <laughs> to the uh, meeting of the tribes. 
So uh, people may be looking to the uh, Silver Fangs as a kind of bellwether for what kind of dangers are coming at them in the future. Uh, so uh, Edge Dancer says it may be because they have been under siege from their enemies, but they're, it acts like they are playing to mitigate losses and not achieve gains, and you have to risk to win. So uh, Spanner is saying that uh, Felker gets done dirty again, which is pretty fair, I think. So, yeah, I also thought it was interesting how they uh, there were people who were actually thinking about the Antinium's offer of land. That would put them in direct conflict with Manus, you know, right after uh, Manus made that uh, mistake, basically training uh, the free Antinium's army of crusaders for them. So uh, they could be seeing the writing on the wall here and thinking that they'll uh, have enemies for this upcoming Antinium war thing. So uh, one thing's for sure is that Aaron is going to come back to a world on fire. Uh, so Kel says, Liscor has got all of those new spider-free floodplains or floodplains and alliances with the human cities in their north, where a couple of Knoll tribes were thinking about trying, plus an alliance with an Antinium hive, and that's a hard combination to beat there. So uh, Comrade Burv says that he sees this as a potential use of Sitar's new skill for people in, from Liscor to show the other tribes what Liscor is like in regards to how they can treat Knolls and the Antinium can be. Oh, that's a uh, an interesting application there. So that whole world of you and me skill could come in handy again. So it looks like we have Mr. Europe and Jamaro typing here. So, uh, the other thing, th there's another aspect to, to the skill, or at least the concept of the skill that I thought was fascinating. I didn't get to type a lot because I had binded hands yesterday. What really, what I was really excited by is the, is the thematic parallels between Aaron's flame skills, the emotion-based skills, the witch's magic, and what the shamans were doing. The shamans are collecting the belief of all of these people and transforming it into magic. And the idea behind it is, is was also built up when we had the near chapter and the ghost folk talked about. Ghost folk, I'm sorry, when we had, um, what is her name? The goblin lady, the one who gets naked all the time. Ulvama. Ulvama, thank you. Ulvama um, was explaining how shaman magic worked. And it, it resonated with me because it gives you the idea that the, se the secret power, the secret skill behind the existence of the, of the white gnolls is the belief, or it gives wind to my theory that what makes the white gnolls exist is that belief. Mm -hmm. Is that because it's been ta talked about as a curse or a blessing or whatever. Now, if that is very much true, then it's a core rejection of a belief within knowledge culture that exists even when it's trying to be, it, it, people are trying to suppress it. Why would someone, like, it, it's that rejection of self theme that comes up. And it's really, really fascinating to find that the, the only way to solve that kind of self-reflection is to use the very tool using being used by the okay. I'm I'm about to go deep dive into suppression, repression, and mental. But you, I, hopefully, you guys get the idea mm -hmm. um, of what that means. Yeah. So I, I'm a, go ahead. Sorry. I yeah, I was just going to read out to Renoris's comment here, but did somebody else have something to say before we move on? Okay, so uh, Renora says, do we think that Karash got set up to be killed by Az? Uh, they were talking about how the Knoll Kingdom fell, and I feel like the traditionalists would benefit most from this. Uh, personally, I think that uh, uh, Karash is in a position to at least try to steal the tome that the Silver Fangs brought. So uh, they showed that off at the meeting of the tribes, and you know now Az and Bella know about this, and you know it's reasonable to think that other powers also know that there's this incredibly fancy book out there. Uh, I don't even know if Eldavin remembers giving it to them because it was uh, Terriark who was, uh, gave the book. So um, there's a lot of potential there for uh, Karash to uh, throw a monkey wrench into the whole proceedings. And uh, he hasn't done a whole lot yet. So I suspect that's going to come up later uh, when we're hitting towards the climax of the meeting of the tribes. Uh, so Edge Dancer is saying, we've seen this before, Oshi, with uh, Kershaw in vol Volume 5. So uh, Jamara is 
uh, saying Satara as a character seems to be set up for the future as indicated by her class and age. Yet another uh, piece of evidence that Pirate intends to have the story go on for many years within the story with the characters growing into adulthood as it goes. Yeah, so uh, I think it would be very interesting to uh, have Satara get the chance to be a rival to Chrysal Wordsmith where uh, Sitar is really dedicated to finding the truth and publishing that. And Chrysler really seems to think of uh, using the truth as a tool for propaganda purposes and to pump up the walled cities in his own community. So uh, Spanner uh, was responding to Renoris there saying, yes, he thinks that Zalkir masterminded it all. And uh, Lynette says, remember, too, that the eldest shaman, uh, shaman remembers Karash. So that wasn't even that long ago. And, uh, you know, introducing him at the meeting of the tribes would, uh, you know, sort of throw a firecracker on <laughs> the, uh, the pile of wood that's been built up here. So it looks like Comrade Burv is typing something. And... Uh, I think after that comment, let's move on to some of the other topics. Yeah, so Comrade Burr says, um, one thing that we've been told about Wardsmith is uh, that being world famous got to his head immediately. And it's nice to see that Sitar is made of sterner stuff, which would definitely make exploring the difference between the two of them uh, something he'd like to read. Yeah, so we've had a, a lot of uh, authors and scholars introduced uh, over the course of this particular volume. So uh, Chrysler Wordsmith appeared a couple of times, but we didn't have deep characterization for him, I think. And, you know, just stuff like the uh, uh, Adventurer book, <laughs> like introducing the D&D &D alignment system, uh, was uh, a pretty funny detail for the sort of things that uh, Chrysler Wordsmith is up to now. So uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, address as another topic in this discussion about shamans themselves, we've seen a lot about what the shaman class looks like and what it is they do in a lot of knowledge communities that are very different uh, over the course of this chapter in particular. So what do you all think about uh, how light has been shown in the social role and the material culture and the magic system uh, of the shaman class itself? Uh, I was interested to see uh, when uh, Sitar was getting dressed in the early chapter, uh, Sitar had a spell pouch instead of a spell book. So uh, that is a distinction, you know, from mages. I'm curious about what kinds of little artifacts they would be carrying around to make their cantrips work or, you know, possibly do greater workings. Uh, so there's that going on. And uh, the shamans, you know, ha there were some very distinctive ones, like the wild waste shaman who was wrestling a cow versus... Uh, the the, uh, the older one who was, you know, offering toffee and get, telling those really long rambling stories. They all do seem to have the history in common, but they can clearly uh, encompass a wide range of personalities. So uh, Spanner is saying that he's curious if Sitar's new class is like the old Noel Shaman's class, as in only one person can have it at a time. So, yeah, we've seen worldly classes before. It's you know, like worldly traveler and worldly prince or uh, princess or so on and you know one thing i personally was curious about is does this shaman of the world have that same advantage of being able to learn outside of normal class progression you know that was the strength that uh were the world lay traveler showed when he had that uh, mantis leap or whatever it was like the grasshopper leap skill that he showed Mercia was that uh, they can learn skills the hard way much more easier than other classes by uh you know talking to people and getting familiar with them and trying things out so I'm, uh, it would be neat to see if uh, Sitar can do that as well. Uh, Metamir says that Noel shamans seem to be similar to Native American medicine men uh, with their oral traditions, mysticism, and leadership methods. Yeah, shamanism is uh, surprisingly widespread uh, across the world. You can see, you know, there's also shamanic traditions in Siberia and so on and in uh, Australia. So uh, it's, you know, part of the sort of common, or common cultural makeup of uh, humanity in a way. So it's uh, just interesting to see the uh, way it gets portrayed in a uh, a vibrant culture within the in-world there. So Kel says heavy shaman shamanistic belief in Korea and Japan as well. So yeah, that's uh, very interesting stuff. You think the draft then have shaman? Uh, I suppose it's possible. It may not be called that exactly, but uh, what do you think? Would, does Shintoism have any ties to shamanism, do you think? 
Uh, I know it's uh, heavily based on, you know, small spirits and animism and so on. Uh, Jamaro is saying that shamans are supposed to uh, use objects that have power due to their significance that mages don't or can't use because they only think in terms of mana and magic. So they could have some pretty weird artifacts, such as a stone from a destroyed walled city's wall would be a usable artifact for them. So uh, Kel says shrine maidens and whatnot, absolutely. Um, uh, Metamir was talking about uh, on my Uji traditions, maybe in terms of connections between uh, you know Japanese uh, shamanic beliefs. Uh, so let's see. That seems to be all the comments we have right now about shamanism. So let's uh, move on to you know writers as a class. We've also uh, gotten some expansion there. Uh, I think definitely one of my favorite parts of the chapter was the uh, writer group when they were meeting in secret in order to exchange their slash fictions and bad poetry. <laughs> so uh, you know that was something that's just so logical to exist, and yet I never thought of it until Pirate brought it out there. That was just great color. Uh, and they have that community that they're using in order to, you know, spread the works of even lesser known figures, you know, also that they can, you know, level and, you know, grow an experience from having feedback from, you know, people who are reading their works. So, uh, and writers also have uh, a considerable ability to influence if they get famous too. So uh, it's a different kind of progression. It's the sort of class that you don't really hear about in traditional uh, fantasy stories where it's all about, uh, you know, like your D and D party kind of dynamics. So, uh, Spanner was talking about the illicit dealings of the writers. You know, God forbid the Antinium erotica authors find out about this trade. Uh, man, just imagine that going through the, the circles. You know, or just circulating among information brokers. So, uh, Cal was talking I'd, about. Yes, I'd like to point out real quick. If you look at the uh, Google Doc summary down at the stream section for this particular part we're talking about where pirate stopped writing to you know mention how much this is a what was it they said I can find it again how this is the weirdest this is the weirdest writing stream they've ever done and the rest of chat went yeah it's really weird novel wolf is going to be so uh, you can't cut it though. You got to leave it in. This is important. Leave it in. So, <laughs> congratulations. We've had a professional editor read fanfic written by a fictional character. <laughs> this is great. Yes, I, that was that was comedy gold all around. Uh, so, Kel was saying that they appreciated the whole uh, poetry reactions that they had, and uh, you know, Courier is suggesting a writer recognizes writer uh, skill. You know, as uh, I suppose game recognizes game would be the uh, the reference there. So yeah, Metamir says uh, bad poetry on poetry. Yeah, so uh, I, I think those are just general reactions. Is that stuff that you want read out loud right there with those reactions, or did you want to put those in general? Bad so poetry. yeah. Oh, no, a tree. Yeah, so uh, Renoris is saying that they want to see a writer convention with San Quinn and Hart Slay and Sitar. Oh, yeah, I mean, San Quinn and Hart Slay are just uh, born rivals there in the Slash Fit community. So uh, that would be very interesting to, you know, see them where, uh, you know, even just realizing that San Quinn is, in fact, the, uh, the Queen of Naravi has fallen. I mean, imagine if, you know... Uh, uh, she ever gets free of Naravia's fall and able to live the life that she actually wants. I mean, there's just, you know, plenty of opportunity for comedy gold right there. Uh, so uh, Edge Dancer was saying time for a meta fan fiction where a, a third writer writes San Quinn and Art Slay fanfic. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and Spanner was uh, pointing out that Hart Slay is, quote, a, a goat faced harridan. So, um, yeah, so let's move on to... I have two more topics that we can cover briefly here, and then we can end the recording. So um, one of them is about, you know, Doombringers themselves. So have we learned anything new about the, the social role of Doombringers in uh, Nolish society? I feel like they were always scapegoats of some kind before, but have we added more depth by seeing the way that the various groups in the meeting of the tribes react to them? So we're starting to get a window into how they function socially, uh, but it's not by any means a resolved question now, I think. And also what kind of historical presence have they had, where um, we now know that there are a lot of stories that uh, may very well have been edited to include Doombringers that didn't used to have them. But, you know, what 
you know, have they actually done? What could have caused, you know, all of this ire about them? Because they seem like they're potentially useful. Uh, Metamir says that they're the boogeyman. They are uh, used to keep people fearful and maintain power. It's, you know, we also saw the Raskar used as boogeyman too. So, uh, but, you know, the Raskar are clearly absolutely outsiders. Uh, the uh, myself, I was kind of interested by the idea that Doombringers could be the threat within. They were just completely scared of this idea that you know a Doombringer may be dying their fur, and then Yellowron was you know thinking about that. They walk among us, you or, or at least they think that you can't have Rasgar that walk among us. But we've seen uh, with uh, Noka after she killed that uh, gang boss Bear Claw, they can absolutely do that. They can do the whole Skimwalker thing. Uh, so. Uh, you know, Metamir was saying they're like communists in the McCarthy era. So, uh, Mr. Europe, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, from the start, basically, or at least from the, uh, like, when uh, Mercia left the inn, I've seen people talking about, like, what possible logical reason could there be for all this? Like, there must be some secret behind it. And I never really understood that, because in real life we have... Uh, uh, tons of examples of people just being scapegoats for this for no logical reason, just because they're different. Here comes someone who will always remind you that a tribe was wiped out or nearly wiped out, and it's a perfect target for uh, scapegoating because, of course, nobody knows them since their tribe is dead and they're. Uh, existence is scary because a tribe was killed. But yeah, it and makes, also- it just makes yeah, it just it makes perfect sense to me that there is no reason. It's just this is, <laughs> this happens often, frequently, and this has happened in our world many times. Mm-hmm. I also think it's significant that the uh, the Doombringers do have this luck skill that they can use that uh, they have good and bad luck in equal measure. Uh, but significantly, there is no obvious way to link cause and effect. If a Doombringer is nearby and something bad happens, uh, a Doombringer can't, you know, say, oh, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> you know? Because, uh, you know, if you have a mage who th- flings a fireball, you can see the fireball. But if you have a someone with a luck skill nearby who just causes events to happen a little bit differently, you know, how can you tell if it was really them or not? So... Uh, Spanner was saying they weren't always scapegoats. Uh, the old shaman, uh, Feka, says that they uh, weren't always vilified, but they were a convenient scapegoat to blame, and stories have changed to shoehorn them into it. Case in point, the Beast of Albaz. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Uh, Renoris, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, they're just scapegoats, and I, I mean, obviously I think they are, but I think, you know, the, <laughs> there was the one arc we got with, like, uh, like the selfids, uh, in and basically Geneva's whole art with the selfids, and I'm just like, you know, the more we developed that arc, the more I was like, oh yeah, there's a good reason like nobody wants to allow selfids to do this because yeah, it is absolutely terrifying. So you know, I I do think that you know it's probably gonna come to light and it's probably gonna be something like okay, you know, maybe it was bad, but you probably have overreacted to this. But I will just say, like, I feel like there have been other times in the story where, like, you know, we, we kind of think, oh, well, it's just bad. Or it's kind of the same thing with, like, goblins, right? Goblins by themselves are fine, but, like, we still have the great question of, like, okay, well, you get a goblin king and then they start killing everybody. Like, what do you do then, right? So I, I think there's probably, I, or at least I hope there's a little bit more complexity to the issue because I feel like we've seeing that complexity with some of these other things, right? Where, with the self and the goblins, I, I, I think being the two examples I can think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's fair. There's uh, a lot of people who uh, face, you know, unwelcomeness or persecution in the in world. You know, you can even point at the vampires, but then they just have this long history and, you know, there can be a seed of why they would oppose this. You know, vampires supposedly had some kind of empire. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's just, you have to deal with the incredibly long history of the in world and, you know, people rising and falling and making mistakes and carrying that baggage with them. So, uh, Jamaro was saying that 
they hope there's a reason why the plane's eye has such a grudge against Doombringers, because the amount of effort and resources putting into killing them is downright shocking, especially when it's been done for at least 400 years. They must be getting something out of it. So yeah, I personally have this idea, you know, maybe that the, the plane's eye artifact is, you know, something that they got from Belavier. There was a brief uh, mention of that plane's eye having rings inside it, which is similar looking to Belavier's eye. And, you know, maybe going after Doombringers is something that Blavier negotiated with them in exchange for the power of that artifact. But I have no idea. So we'll see, uh, you know, what happens ultimately. But that's something that I suspect may be the case. So uh, Metamir was responding to Jamara saying they gain power and prestige from it, which is, you know, a legitimate possible motive. Uh, Lord Panther says that uh, possibly they're able to use their luck changing powers or, uh, into power their shamans. Huh. So I guess that's another possibility, like somehow harvesting the Doombringer's luck ability. I don't know. Uh, so Jamaro is saying, but the other tribes don't know uh, how serious about Doombringer's the plan's eye is. They aren't like the Osmoari who are known for their role. So uh, Comrade Burr says the biggest thing about, or they thought about seeing the stories about Doombringer's is if everyone in the tribe involved died, how the hell did they know White Knoll was involved? Which is another great question. And it looks like the answer is that they did not because the Doombringer just keeps getting inserted in every part of the story. So Metamir says, when Doombringers don't understand their power, uh, they will cause bad things to happen, making them a taboo. They reinforce the cycle. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Mr. Europe, you had one more thing to say? Yeah, uh, there's one important thing uh, which uh, I have said that I, uh, it's, I think it's very important that not all racism in the in world is has a concrete uh, like a justified uh, reason behind it because that's not how it works in mm-hmm. the real world. Yeah, it's a, I, I don't. I really don't like the idea that uh, oh, racism exists in the story. Clearly, they must have done something <laughs> to <laughs> deserve it partially. Like it's kind. Of, I don't like the idea that that's a requirement. Uh, the yeah, idea that, and I don't think it is. Uh, yeah, but just to uh, respond to this, like that the uh, goblins and the selfids have uh, actual reasons for people to be kind of scared of them, uh, but I don't think that's a good thing that, that we should expect that from every kind of hatred, so to speak, in the story. Yeah, I mean, there's the uh, example of halflings, too, that uh, Terriarch talked about. They were unfairly blamed for acts of theft that Terriarch said that humans themselves were doing. So uh, there have definitely been examples of, you know, baseless uh, bigotry just because they were there. And even what Jungle Tales is gearing up to do to all these fairlings, they have almost no connection to um, Nears Astorgon himself, but they have just decided that the Fairlings need to go because that will somehow allow themselves to become, again, the prominent lizard folk company, as if they actually needed to do that. So, uh, Dragon723 is saying, the Raskar separated Marsha from the others and seemed real mad when they weren't allowed to sacrifice her. Uh, maybe they were uh, considered Doombringers because they attract Raskar? Uh, which is uh, an interesting question there. Uh, Jamara was saying, also, we can likely expect Wanderer to come to the Null Moot, and uh, he should be healed by now, and should, uh, has to take care of Marsha. So, big Doombringer entrance. Uh, yeah, and if he uh, you know, comes out of nowhere with his white fur and things, that'll be a, a very dramatic thing. Uh, Edge Dancer says that he doesn't think that we can entirely rule out drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, he bets lots of uh, Plains Eye Nulls genuinely think that Doombringers are a threat and will go to great lengths to remove the perceived threat. So yeah, uh, Comrade Burv, uh, he would like to reply to the in-world racism threat if he has the time. Sure. Hello, Comrade Burv here. Uh, with the in-world racism thing, it, it's unclear as to how you know racism would happen in a fantasy world where there are literally different races. Because in the real world, we, we are, we're only humans. We only have humans to talk to, and people will you know divide based on that. Like People would divide left hand versus right hand. In the in-world, like, there are goblins and there are, are minotaurs, and I, I could see an argument that maybe we don't know how racism would work in that kind of world, that maybe uh, people would discriminate less in their own race if there were other races there. I'm not terribly sure. Mm-hmm. That's all. 
Okay, so uh, Edge Dancer said that the attacks on the Frailing Villages were to draw Neards out from hiding and force him to reveal himself and make mistakes, not just for fun and vengeance. But yeah, they're still, you know, targeting you know this whole civilization just because of like one guy and a small handful of his uh, helpers there. So uh, that's definitely tarring a whole bunch of people with one brush. Yeah, so uh, let's have this one comment from uh, Edge Dancer, and then I will end the recording, and then we can go to the freeform discussion because we're starting to range, you know, sort of outside of uh, the uh, the topics of the chapter. And we've covered pretty much everything that I wanted to look at. So, uh, Edge Dancer, did you uh, want to say one more thing? It looks like you're not topic or typing right now. No, nope? okay, he's done. So, uh, Oshi, you had one last question that you wanted to do. All right. All right. All right. Uh... So we've had newt stuff happening for a while now. Are we at a point where, um, I don't know how to say this, but do you think Pirate has decided, you know what, forget it. The question is something for afterwards because I realize how rude it is. Not not to Pirate, it's just, just <laughs> very, very not appropriate for listeners, sorry. You just stouse yourself in gasoline and set yourself on fire. <laughs> Callous saying typical. Sorry, I had to nope it. I don't think I can I don't think I can actually ask out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell you what, how about we'll cut the recording here and then we will open it up to the uh, informal discussion. I'm I'm, uh, I'm supposed to compliment Pirate once before the recording is over. Okay. Yes. Pirate Abba used the right color. <laughs> I was expecting you to say, I like your haircut. <laughs> I mean, you could have said something about how magnificent it was to have the climax of this chapter, which was awesome, and had Lynette crying for good reason. But uh, yeah, I guess you, I guess Pirate used the right color for something. We can go with that. And that concludes TWI Talks after chapter discussion for the interlude featuring Sitar. Go ahead and join us next time. Hope to see you soon.